how on earth is Augustana? And I saw some tweets like, they're better than you think they are. No. Th- th- no. This is a Division Two team coming into the uh, the black jersey game in a sellout crowd in Brookings. Welcome to the official podcast of FCS Fan Station with your hosts, Kyler Neal, Matthew Frazee, and Jamie Williams. FCS fans nation. Holy moly, are these teams overrated? What a weekend of FCS football, as Jamie Williams would say. God, I think these teams just stink. Welcome to the FCS Fans Nation podcast. Kyler Neal, Matt Frazee, Jamie Williams, first year a- airwaves for this FCS crazy chaos uh, last week that we just experienced. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. If you're listening ad-free on Patreon, shout out to our FCS Gold members. Uh, Mr. Kelly DM'd us. He just joined FCS Gold. Um, really talked super kindly about our podcast. Appreciate you, Mr. Kelly. And uh, I see you, Jamie, rocking Southern Illinois gear. Jeremiah Rash, the man, the myth, the legend, now an FCS Gold member. He's always been golden in our hearts, though. What an incredible human. And uh, we're just happy that you guys are here. If you're listening on YouTube, hit that subscribe and like. Appreciate you. Apple, Spotify, all that. Kyler Neal, before we get going into the Big Six tonight, you had an incredible experience. Maybe not so much for your team on the field, but down there in Louisiana. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Oh, man, what a shitty game. Um, But I got to meet Danny. So, of course, Danny Johnson, one of the best um, fans of all time. Right, he gave me this shirt. He also said he's ordering my wife a shirt. He said I'm one lucky guy to be able to have a wife like that. He doesn't understand it. Um, <clears throat> None of it was, us do, Danny. No, it was it was a it was a really fun time. What I would say is that stadium is actually pretty nice. Um, you know, it, it's nothing crazy in the grand scheme of things, but beautiful turf, beautiful stadium. Um, you know, really awesome fan base. I had a great time there. The only negative thing outside of the game, of course would be the announcer for Southern Illinois. I mean, so- Southeastern Louisiana is rough. Um, he, he tries to do this, like, Christopher Walken impression the whole time. And uh, it's, it's oh, it got pretty bad. You know, he's like, <laughs> I, I can't even say it because I don't have a good Christopher Walken impression. But other than that, I mean, it's a great time. It, it was fun. Uh, I encourage you guys, you know, see as many a, a different away games as you can. Um, try and meet up with other people on the page because, yeah, it's it's fantastic time. They, they did a good job down there in you know Hammond, America. The photos uh, photos of you two studs look pretty good. Yeah, if you keep scoring touchdowns on me, I'm gonna stab you in the face with a cider iron. That's pretty good. I mean, that's what it was. The slap your mama. This was given to me. This hot sauce by Danny Johnson. He mailed that to me. Danny, that's I still haven't tried about. it. As I DM of oh, seasoning, yeah. As I DM'd you about Danny, I, I would die. But uh, so I, I decided to keep it behind me in honor of you. So. That's straight from Louisiana right there. Uh, Gentlemen, we have a lot to get to. There are a lot of complaints out there in FCS land. There are people who are happy but aren't happy. They're sad, but they have reason to celebrate. This is a uh, strange time as we move into the FCS season. And I don't think anybody's upset about it because we actually have teams that a lot, I think, that maybe could compete for our national title. So let's get right to it. Let's get to the top six. What are FCS fans talking and posting about nonstop? It's time for the top six topics of the week. We begin. It seems to have been quiet for the NDSU Bison. We haven't had as many questions about them. Things have been going according to plan for them. Up until this last weekend, a lot to take away for my glorious herd. And here we go. The NDSU Bison barely barely i'm talking 0.01% chance espn had of them winning late in the fourth barely rallying to beat etsu what a classic game and a pretty incredible outcome if you're just if you were an unbiased bison just watching that game i tell you what 
Renee starts us out here, even though NDSU pulled it out, should they still be ranked number two? And gentlemen, I really want to use our questions for the top six this week as springboards. Of course, I want to answer the direct questions like, Renee, this is a great one. Should NDSU be number two? But every question here in these top six topics, we can really expand into because there's a lot of questions about these rankings and where these teams should be right now. But uh, let's start with the Bison right now, and I'll give you the floor right away, Kyler, in terms of what you think, because you're kind of rocking those Bison colors. Uh, and uh, what do you? what is your takeaway after two weeks where they look good, and now this week, not so great? Um, I mean, this is just college football, especially in college football in the time of maybe the portal, the transfers. Uh, I, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of teams that are going to be able to keep up with other teams that maybe historically haven't. Also, maybe this was ETSU's best game on the season. North Dakota State's worst game on the season, right? So it's it's hard to just, like, you know, completely trash one team when they still came out with a win on the road. Uh, get, I get it. It was much closer than it was supposed to be. Unfortunately, I didn't get to watch the game, so I don't know exactly the details. I just saw some of the texting thread because, of course, I was at the game same time. But um, I think people are, are going to read too much into this. I mean, there was a time where North Dakota State – you know, they were winning national title, national title, national title. They had close games uh, against maybe not great teams. They also lost to probably one of the worst teams of all time when it was like Indiana State, right? So I think people like to overreact, especially this early in the season. If they would have lost, I think there's definitely a question where they, where it would be, should they be ranked number two? And the answer is 100% no, because they lost. But at the end of the day, they won. Um, so I think people just need to, you know, Tone it down a little bit. I think really anywhere between two and four, maybe two and five, is probably realistic for this North Dakota State team. But if just because of this one performance where they sneaked out of a win against a team that wasn't very good last year, but they had history of successful seasons, you know, just a few seasons ago, I, I, I think maybe people are jumping the gun a little bit. Um, I mean, that's pretty much what I'll say. I mean, Cam Miller still did not have an interception, so he's – uh with Kikoa, with no interceptions on the season, thrown pretty damn good. Um, the running game was there for it. looks like NDSU. It looks like they rushed all over them. And the nice thing is, you know, champions win at the end of the day, and they overcome adversity. And, what well, you guys were down with 40 seconds left, something like that, and you came back and actually got the W. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, if you didn't, if you didn't see the game, the Bison were down 12 with about five and a <clears> half <throat> minutes left. And they, then were they, down, were down, they were down 12 with a minute and a half left. Yeah, they, they score, they get the onside kick, and then they take it down for those 55 yards with 50 seconds left and put it into the end zone. I mean, so guess what? that that screams more to me right there with that handling adversity and still coming away with a win than maybe a close win. And now you should drop down quite a bit in the rankings. I mean, the the effort of that team, that's a championship caliber team going, guess what? The game is not over till it's over. We still have a chance. A lot of other teams give up in that scenario because they're mentally defeated. They don't have that ability to bounce back. North Dakota State's not one of them. So, yeah, you could put them at two. You could put them at three, four, five. It doesn't matter to me. It's still so early in the season. But I wouldn't penalize someone too much from uh, squeaking out a close win on the road, especially after being down by 12 and now actually still seeing it out with a win. That's pretty freaking fantastic. Yeah, the offense looked really good. Um, I, a few questionable play calls, but like, whatever. You know, new coaching staff, away we go. Cam Miller looked great. Ball was running well. Offensively, it was great. The defense looked like hot garbage. Like, if you're a Bison fan, like, if you guys were just watching it, the defense alignment, missing tackles. Linebackers, missing tackles. Like, literally, our secondary guys hitting way above the shoulder pads trying to take ETSU players down. It's like they didn't even show up for the game. So... I'm with Kyler in terms of like you found a way to win. That's great. But what Coach Paul like said at the end of the game was really was well said, which is, hey, it's hard to win. So we have to celebrate this. But everybody's going to hate seeing me on Monday because it's not going to be fun because that defensive effort was really piss poor. The The defensive alignment was pretty terrible. We kind of lined up like we were playing Eastern Washington or a spread pass up tempo offense, only rushing four. there was no blitz concept. And ETSU, they, they only completed five passes. They only threw like 13. And uh, North Dakota State's defense looked just like what you would have seen when they played Montana State last year in the playoffs. You know, 500 yards given up, just a track meet. And, you know, they looked good against Colorado defensively for what they were facing. Obviously, in week two uh, against Eddie George's squad, that's no competition in the Fargo Dome. But I think a lot of people thought this wouldn't be competition either. The reality is this for NDSU. 
it shouldn't be a panic mode moment. Um, but if they play like that in the Valley stretch of when they get UND, Southern Illinois, SDSU, <laughs> they're going to lose two, if not all three of those games. The offense looked great. Cam Miller's a stud. But defensively, that was an embarrassing effort for North Dakota State for the standard. Now, in terms of the ranking, I hate rankings. I'm not good at them. I'm never involved in them. So I'll leave this one to Jamie. Jamie, how do you feel about that with what you saw from North Dakota State and where this ranking should go compared to how like Idaho and others look really good? Well, for me, uh, Renee's question is, should they still be ranked number two? I didn't have them at two coming into the week. Um, a lot of people did. That's why they were number two. They'll probably stay number two because slot voting. Um, but that's not a problem right now. But it's also not too early to really start looking at and thinking about resume. So I, th I think right now we've got four teams that have kind of separated themselves from everybody else for the moment. And I'm going to include North Dakota State in that because we don't – this year is this year, so the past shouldn't matter. But history dictates that NDSU is going to be there. So I'll talk about four teams, and I'll, then I'll tell you what I think the next tier is. So I'm going to talk about South Dakota State, North Dakota State, Montana State, and Idaho. So of those four, Montana State and Idaho both have FBS wins. So that's a step up on their resume. Idaho also has a ranked win that they got yesterday. Well, we, could de we can debate whether Albany should be ranked to the committee at the end of the year. That's a ranked win. Albany doesn't look very good to me. Idaho hammered them uh, without having to do a whole lot on offense, but that's kind of Idaho's MO right now uh, with that defense and uh, what Jason Eck and the and team are doing. So with a ranked win and an FBS win, right now, Idaho has the best resume, in my opinion. Then you're looking at Montana State. They've got an FBS win and then a couple of other uh, mm -hmm. FCS wins that they've got. Uh, when you look at NDSU, they lost their FBS game. Doesn't hurt them. They beat. They have two FCS wins. Neither one of them are ranked, but they're FCS wins, so they're two and zero uh, towards their their resume. Um, so they're right there. Then you got to look at the defending champs. They have they lost their FBS game just like NDSU, so not going to hurt them. Uh, then they have a ranked win against Incarnate Word last week. The problem for South Dakota State is this past week, they played Augustana, who is not an FCS team. It's it, it's a sub-D1 team. That does not uh, count towards their resume. Uh, it could be considered, but to me, that puts them a little bit behind. So I still think with the ranked win over Incarnate Word, it will slightly uh, slide them above NDSU. Uh, but as far as resume, the two Dakota states are three and four right now. And if you want to look at some teams that are coming, Central Arkansas looks really good, and they should be undefeated. Uh, we know what the Sun Belt um, officiating crew did. Uh, Southern Illinois, Montana's not going to go away, but the team that beat them, North Dakota, a lot of good home games for them, so their schedule could set up. Um, and then South Dakota, they just lost their opportunity to FCS win yesterday. Uh, their game was canceled, so that could hurt them at the end. Yeah, it's fun to hear you go down those rankings. And honestly, this has been a long time coming where it could end up NDSU, SDSU at the end. But boy, it sure feels like there's some weaknesses and the armor is a little bit dented on these Bison and Jackrabbits. And other teams are coming in for the kill, and they're looking really, really good. And Jamie, you kind of set up our next question. It's from Jordan Thule. Jordan says, who had more of an underwhelming win? NDSU has 27-point favorites, or SDSU only winning by 21 versus a D2 team? Okay, from a guy who gave up on NDSU, kept the tweet up how I said we had lost, said we played like hot garbage, and the defense looked like trash. I will say this. In terms all of, of that's true win, except for the final result. All of that's true except the final result. Correct. Uh, the thing I will say, though, in terms of underwhelming, like NDSU did go play an FCS team on the road, Trey Lamb, great coach um, with a team that brought in a ton of transfers from a talented squad last year on the same level of competition. So at face value, Jordan, just to answer your question here, I do think South Dakota State's win is more underwhelming. And I don't think South Dakota State fans would disagree because of this. It was like the third quarter of the NDSU game. And I was like, where is Thumper and Dallas and Alex? I'm like, where are the tweets? There has to be something like... I mean, 
those guys, I love them as humans, but you got to talk a little smack on NDSU. We're getting our can kicked in UTSU, and there was nothing. And I didn't even look at their score. And then I looked at the messages and score. I'm like, what on earth? How on earth is Augustana? And I saw some tweets like, they're better than you think they are. No. No. This is a Division II team coming into the uh, the black jersey game and a sellout crowd in Brookings. Um, so at face value, South Dakota State's win, way more underwhelming. But I want to take this again as a springboard. All of these questions are going to be springboards tonight to talk about South Dakota State. Because beating Incarnate Word, it took till late in the third quarter, and that is a top 25 win. This Augustana win is gross. And Oklahoma State is a really good FBS team. That's what's supposed to happen. But there's a vibe of these Jackrabbit fans, and things just don't feel the same. I've seen some comments by them of, man, I don't even know if we're top five. And those might be the psycho fans. Uh, but I'm really excited to hear the Jackrabbit Illustrated guys go through their pods this week. Jamie, right back to you, man. Is there something weird about South Dakota State right now, or is something just going to take some time? Where are your thoughts with them? I mean, unless you're Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, when you lose that much to the NFL and graduation of experienced senior class, there's going to be a step back. And that's kind of what we're seeing. But they were so far ahead of everybody else that a step back should just bring them almost to the pack. Now, Mark wasn't great yesterday. He, I mean, they got the win. I, I, if you listen to um, Kevin and Stone on, the, on FCS Nation Radio, Stone was calling this the Chase Mason game because they figured it'd be 45 nothing at half and run them out the building and Chase Mason would get to show out a little bit. And that just didn't happen. They just could not get that rhythm going. And now maybe they're looking ahead to what's next. And, you know, that's that's okay. I mean, th- if you look at the next three on their schedule there, since you've got it up, they shouldn't have an issue with any of those teams. And then guess what? <laughs> then, it, then it gets a little tougher for the next two. So that they've got three games to work out the kinks because they should be significantly better than all three of those teams. And Youngstown was ranked. We go here for the first one for the first time this week. Youngstown stinks. Youngstown is yeah. not good. And, you know, that close loss to Villanova looked good for them. I think it now looked worse for Villanova, especially after what Villanova did yesterday. And then Youngstown goes and loses to Duquesne at home. There, there's things going on out there. There's nobody outside of Montana State and Idaho that have really asserted themselves this year yet. So it's wide open. Uh, there's a long way to go. But it, like I said earlier, it's not t- too late to think about resume and – if we think back to last year, Montana against Ferris State, now the game was significantly closer, but it's funny to hear South Dakota State fans saying the same thing Montana fans said last year about how good that mm-hmm. D2 team is. Don't want to hear it. So, But the same thing could and might still happen, still wind up in Frisco. So, you know, don't overreact to it, but understand that South Dakota State's not going to just destroy everybody this year. That's just not. That's just not where we are. Yeah, NDSU won a lot of championships that way of just not destroying everybody all the time. Again, another little NDSU comp for those bunnies. Uh, Kyler, are you the voice of reason here? You were the voice of reason with North Dakota State, but you have kind of quietly thought that maybe SDSU is not the top team this year. It's been very quiet. It's like a little whisper in the wind in the background of these pods. Yeah, just like that. So Um, it's not your time to say I'm right this, that, but what are you thinking on the rabbits right now? It's definitely way too early to, to say anything. And I wouldn't say they're not the number one team. They have been the number one team in my you know poll every single week. And I think it's hard to knock them off until maybe, you know, it's deeper in the season and maybe a couple teams lose vice versa. So I'll still have them at number one, but definitely I think that gap is by far decreased in terms of they're not as good as they were last year. And guess what? This, this is a good D2 team. Okay. It's just like fair state in that terms. It's a good D2 team who got to the second round of the D2 playoffs and then got murdered by 50 to the actually good D2 teams. So, you know what? Um, Colorado Mines, I think, beat them like 50 or 60 to 10. So this isn't a good showing if you are, you know, the defending, two-time defending national title. And um, Mark Gronowski, I'm not going to say he's not that guy or, or whatever, but he has not looked the same, right? This year, he has not looked as good. And that's kind of one of the things I was talking about last year. I went, licking. He has the best offensive line. He has some of the best 
tools around him in terms of tight ends, wide receivers. He's losing all that. So now we get to see what really Mark Gronowski is all about. And is he able to elevate a team or was the team elevating him? And again, I don't mean to seem rude or, or negative because I think he's a smart player. I think he makes a lot of good decisions, but he hasn't made the greatest decisions in two of the three games. And even he started kind of struggling, um, in my opinion, versus, you know, a, uh, uh, incarnate word. And then finally, you know, he started picking him apart and then it was, he looked like the Gronowski of old. So in two of the three games, he hasn't looked that good. Um, guess what? It's still very early in the season. He can still completely turn it around. He could still have one of those 27 touchdowns and only four interceptions. Maybe he doesn't throw an interception the rest of the year. Again, a lot of these teams are still working out the kinks, but yeah, if you're the two time defending champion and you are supposed to just be this dominant team that should easily be the number one team you probably should beat this team by quite a bit more, especially sellout blackout game. I mean, it looked cool. Um, but I think this is just what's going to happen in the next few years of, you know, college football with the portal. You're going to see some, some teams get gutted right away. You're also going to see some teams that maybe weren't good who have a chance to just really elevate themselves right after. And it could be a really quick build could be a really quick burn at the same time. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll keep them as number one until maybe, a few weeks down the road. Let's see what they do, you know, at North Dakota State. Like I said last week, I think that's that's really the only time where I think I'll be able to put a grasp on who these two teams really are. I don't think we learned a lot this week from most of the FCS, unfortunately. That's I wanted to expand on, on that. Go back. I meant to bring this up when we were talking about NDSU and East Tennessee State, just to expand on a point Collar made about how the portal works. East Tennessee State, yeah, they were 3-8 and eight last year, but you can't just look at it and say, oh, they almost lost to a team that was 3-8 and eight last year. Yes, that's a fact, but Trey Lamb is the guy you got to look at. They East Tennessee State hired him away from Gardner Webb, brought in a lot of transfers. It's a completely new team. I'm going through it with my team on the opposite way. We, you know, we lost our coach, and now, you know, the Indiana JMU Dukes are three and zero, and we're two and zero, but we don't look as good. And so things can change quickly. So I, I think that's where I think that's where we got to really pump the brakes a little bit and understand there's a the new kind of era of college football has been ushered in and, and you can't just t always say, Oh, this team was this last year. So they're going to be this, this year. Cause that's just not going to happen. Yeah. And at the end of the day, the Dakota schools, they didn't look great, but nobody still is going to want them to come walking into their stadium, come playoff time or have to travel. Hell no. So Hell no. at this point, we'll see where it goes. We'll get more evidence next week. Of course, Okay, Kyler, your time to shine here. And you know what? These fan bases, I feel, because this is a springboard, Eric Kletke coming through, they have just been patiently waiting for maybe now some proof and their moment to be like, we deserve to be ranked higher and we want some respect. I know that it's early, but now's the time to talk about the big sky and two of those top teams Combined with how does ranking teams look? Is this a prediction? Is it a resume? Where are we? Eric Kletke says, does the upcoming game between Idaho and Montana State determine who will win the Big Sky? Now, we're three, four weeks away from that. So we've got some things in between, including some pretty good matchups that could impact stuff. It certainly looks like these are the two teams to beat. We shouldn't discount the Grizz quite yet. But Kyler, what do you think right now? from what Idaho and Montana state are doing in comparison to those Valley top dogs and where's the big sky going to go throughout the next couple of weeks and who's going to raise that title, I guess is where, what Eric's looking at. I mean, I hate to say like, does the upcoming game it's in like a month, right? So, so it's not like this is happening, you know, next week and I don't know what's going to happen. This season already looks like there's a lot more parity potentially. And again, it's early in the season. So, this is the overreaction time. We're always going to completely overreact. And then at the end of the season, it all kind of work itself out. And we're going to realize how stupid maybe all of us were for overreacting. But I mean, Idaho still has to play and they're down, you know, quarterbacks and their quarterback play has not looked good. I mean, their, their quarterback plays a 50% play. I mean, that that's what they are. They're 50% accurate. Luckily they have a strong defense. I don't think Albany was very good. They struggled versus what long Island, so it's, I think, like I said last week, I don't think anyone in the CAA is actually good at all. I mean, Monmouth just beat the shit out of Maine at home worse than Montana State did. And Eastern made Monmouth look like a joke. And Eastern looks like one of the worst teams in the country. So I, I have a feeling that there's just not a lot of good teams maybe this year in, in the grand scheme of things. But 
Idaho still has to play in Northern Arizona, who has looked good against non-Power 4 teams. Um, I mean, they their offense looks like they are rolling through teams. Um, and I get it. They've only played two bums in terms of, what, Utah Tech, and then they played a Division two or NAIA team, but they put up 40 and 60 points in those. So Idaho still has to play NAU. I don't know if it's at NAU or at Idaho, but that elevation can be, you know, a game changer, especially with a high-flying offense. Idaho also has to play UC Davis, who has been Idaho's kryptonite of late. They, I don't think they've beaten UC Davis since they came back down to the FCS. I could be wrong on that, so don't. this is all just me on the fly. But I, I think that's been their kryptonite, UC Davis. And UC Davis looks like a very tough team. So, I mean, and then again, they don't play Montana State for a full month. So we have a full month of still data that we have to figure out what's going on. No, no schedule has been balanced. It's It seems like those are... By far the two front runners, just like Jamie was saying, in terms of resumes, they're the best. You know, they're both top four teams. They should be in everyone's top four. And who would judge them if you put them both in the top two? Probably people who aren't paying attention. Um, so potentially that could definitely be the winner. But again, we we see these conferences where anything can happen. I mean, Weaver State just looked horrible. Well, they didn't look horrible, but they lost to uh, they lost their game to Lamar. So anything can happen in any of these conferences, and all these teams know each other now. So I I don't want to just say, yeah, that's the game that's going to determine it. Montana could be back. UC Davis looks strong. NAU looks good. Idaho State looks frisky. We're ignoring Sac State, who, yeah, they're they're one and two, but it's two FBS losses, and they look competitive in each of them. So, yeah, I think we're jumping the gun a little too early. Every single answer I have, Matt, is going to be stop, stop judging a little too early. I think we all need to be a little more patient. But as of right now, yes, those do look like the two front runners, and that game looks like it will be massive. But don't, uh, we'll have to see. Don't listen to Kyler FCS fans. When you are feel like your team's going to lose or something's gone wrong, just send the tweet, overreact at all times, and steer into your heart. That's that's what I do. At Matthew Frazier on Twitter, if you want to see some horrible takes <laughs> and watch me eat crow. But I like what you said there, Kyler. And honestly, I was unaware of this. It is interesting. It is, it, you know, we got like four out of conference games because of the 12 game schedule this year. But it's interesting looking at if you're watching on YouTube, you can see all these two and one teams and kind of the teams you mentioned. The idea that the Grizz are just dead in the water is false. I mean, this is going to be a very competitive conference all the way to the end. And I don't, by any stretch of the imagination, feel like Idaho or Montana State is elite above everyone else. I think Montana State for sure deserves more credit right now than. Than 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 Idaho, uh, you can put them maybe put them even, but like I think because Idaho looks so good against Oregon, that we're just ignoring Montana State. Like people just aren't talking about the Bobcats, even with them being ranked top five. They are just this quiet monster in the background, and I don't really know why that is. Jamie, because they were off this week. <laughs> is it well for sure? But like they looked pretty darn good in every single yep. one of these games they've done. So. Jamie, big sky, big chaos coming down for Eric Kleck, Key and the crew, or what? Yeah, I mean, like Kyler said, it's it's way too early to point at that game and say that's for the, the conference. The brawl might be for the conference. Think about just if Montana makes one play against North Dakota and beats them, that's a nice win for them. And it didn't happen. They they choked it, they blew it, whatever happened. I, I get it. But the 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 big sky is wide slam open. And we're repeating ourselves saying those two look like the top two, but that's a, still a deep, deep conference. I, I've watched, actually, I saw quite a few of these teams yesterday back and forth. Um, Weber State, I, you got to give credit to Lamar there. I thought Lamar's defense looked really good. Weber had a lot of chances. Um, Lamar made a, a goal line stand. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, Montana to Idaho, Montana, whatever they 59 to two. Hey, it was a score of So that's pretty cool. Uh, Kyler mentioned Northern Arizona. They're running through people. UC Davis. I watched a big chunk of their game. They were okay. I mean, Lane Larison and Hastings are very good. Uh, they took a dominant third quarter and that's how they won their game. But sometimes all you need to do is make a couple plays. Uh, you know, it's, in Sacramento state, they're buried down there just because, you know, what is that alphabetical order or something? I don't know. But they, you know, they picked up a, a nice win yesterday, and they had had two F, FBS losses where they were competitive in both. So don't count them out. So there's five or six teams that are still going to have something to say about this. So I, I can't just pinpoint one game and say, "Yep, that's it. That's that's where we're going to know." 
because there's a long way to go and there's a lot of competition. And you got to give compliments to, to like Montana's and others. Sure. They play trash opponents, right? But you can't sit there with NDSU and be like champions find a way to win. Well, when you play a bad D2, whoever crap team, you're supposed to blow the rails off them. And that's what Montana did. I don't know if Idaho is supposed to annihilate Albany the way they did, but they absolutely did got it done. So, you know, if teams are doing what they're supposed to, they don't control the schedules. These are put out years ahead of time. You got to give them a little bit of respect. So it's, the big sky is weird. And sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. You're big good. Also weird. And I do think they have the hardest home field environments to play in terms of, again, I've said this for a long time, even when North Dakota was jumping over the Missouri Valley, I said, they'll be better in the Valley than they were in the big sky. Because all you have to do is prep for the team in the Valley uh, where the big sky, you got to prep for, it's going to go from 70 degrees to 10 degrees. It's going to go from zero wind to, you know, 40 mile per hour winds. You're going to go from sea level to 7,000 feet. You're also going to have to, you know, travel quite a bit to multiple different time zones. So the difference is the big sky. Like if you have a home game, you do have a little bit more advantage than maybe some of the other programs around the nation. So, and you know, when you have a bigger conference, these schedules are not balanced at all. So, you know, you, it just depends. And just to look at two teams and go, ah, this is for the title. This is hundred percent it when there hasn't been really any big sky team played besides Weber versus Portland state. It's a little bit, a little bit too soon. A little bit too soon. It might be the theme. It was, it was springboarding, you know, springboarding to other questions, but I think the theme that we're having this episode is for sure. Maybe a little too soon. Well, you know what? Since it's a little too soon, let's just predict the Southland Conference champion. Why not? You know, we might as well do it. Hey, these are good from the Rev and Tim Rask. Should Lamar be ranked in the top 25? Who looks more primed to win the Southland? Incarnate Word of Lamar? Or is it a three-team race if you include McNeese with those two? I wrap up those Tim and Rev questions into, is the Southland a three-team race between Incarnate Word, Lamar, and McNeese? And Kyler, you just experienced some Southland football. Before I go to you, though, I just, Jamie, tell me about Lamar a little bit. Sam Herter just put out a tweet in support of them in the top 25. And then, Kyler, I'd like to get your your thoughts on the race of the Southland. Jamie, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, I, I definitely think Lamar is not only rankable, but they will appear in my ballot this week. I, I think they've done a nice job. They were within seven points of Texas State in week one and had a chance to you know get the ball and see if they could tie the game. And Texas State's not a bad team. They're good. They damn. They should have won the other day. Um, well, I, I won't say that. They played a good game the other day, and they, they happened to lose to Arizona State. Um, they got a good offense. Lamar held them to 24. But then they have the win over Weber State, and whoever the heck they beat the week before, I don't remember. Let's see. I think I have their schedule. It's up. Mississippi State, and they struggled. That That's State, one of yeah. the worst teams so, of all time. And that was so. that was a tough one. So it's, it's up and down. Uh, Lamar's definitely coming on. They're rankable, but as far as the Southland race, uh, are we forgetting that Nichols exists too? I mean, they they mm -hmm. they won it last year. I don't know that they're going to win it this year. They're only three. To, yeah, they have two FBS games in at, at Sac State. Um, so you know, I'm not going to count them out. The only teams I'd count out are Northwestern State and, and Commerce and Houston Christian. And I don't see McNeese being a team that's going to fight for anything. So I'm I'm still if you want me to say what I think is going to happen I'm still going to bet that UIW wins that conference. That would be my guess. I would take UIW, um, just because you know they had a couple of losses to Valley schools. Um, last night was close. They had they had the ball and, and Southern Illinois defense stepped up. Um, but yeah, I'd say UIW. Lamar and Nichols are the three teams to watch right now in that conference. But like we said before, still too early. Yeah, I can't I can't fathom not thinking Incarnate Word is isn't the the favorite right now. And th maybe this is extreme valley biased, but like taking South Dakota State in, deep into the third quarter, where people probably thought that game should have been a, you know, probably not as close, pretty impressive from Incarnate Word to go up there into Brookings and then to go play Southern Illinois and take them right down to the wire. Those are two top four Missouri Valley teams. And Missouri Valley is basically the standard at this point. So they I don't think anybody thought Incarnate Word would put up that much of a fight or get that close to winning. Gosh, if they had stolen one of them, you know, the Southern Illinois game, that then we're talking a whole different ballgame. It's probably not even a question, right? Then we're sitting here thinking, oh man, yeah, Incarnate Word's ready to run. 
So I think that iron sharpened iron, I think that that hot start for them, I think once they get into the play here in the Southland, I think they're going to roll some of these teams. So I'm I'm really high in Incarnate Word because of what they've shown so far in the out of conference. Now, Kyler, you, you saw things firsthand there, Southeast Louisiana. What do you feel about the Southland right now? I think the Southland's interesting. Um, I think they're overperforming right now in the grand scheme of things. They may be where we all thought the Southland was. Um, you know, I think if we're asking, you know, about the question on, hey, does Lamar deserve to be ranked, all that, I think it's very fair. They probably have one of the better FCS wins so far on the season. Um, so if you're looking at a, at a pure resume standpoint, yeah, you should probably put them in your top 25. Now, if you're thinking kind of outside the box and, and maybe putting more to the eye test and just thinking what they're going to be in the future, maybe you don't have them in the top 25. Maybe you also think Weaver's not as good just because they blew out Portland State. But before that, their quarterback, you know, threw 12 percent. So you look like the worst quarterback in the face of the earth. So I don't know. This is I think the Southland is interesting. I think the, the the cool thing about the Southland is if we're looking at the portal and what's happening, they probably benefit the most from some amazing talent with a lot of maybe g5 programs p4 programs that are in that area where they're going to be able to pick up quite a bit of talent because the kids aren't getting playing time so so these are these are a lot of teams who in within a year can 100 percent reload with the portal maybe more than some of the other teams that are up north or out west just because there's an abundance of talent and they may reap the benefits a little bit more than everyone else but what i what i did see at least live um they they don't look at least as you know, Southeastern Louisiana, they're not very big team. They do not look very athletic. I, I get, I'm saying that even though we lost, but even Eastern looked a lot more athletic and big. Um, they just looked like they had a much worse coach. So I'll say that. So I think you have Lamar, you have incarnate word, you have Nichols. I wouldn't count out Stephen F. Austin. I wouldn't even count out McNeese right now. So th this is going to be a fun conference that everyone should pay attention to. Maybe this is the new SoCon where anything can happen and maybe they have four playoff caliber teams that are like fighting through it. But then at the end of the season, only one's actually going to make the playoffs because they're going to start murdering each other and beating each other all up. But what I can say is at least the Southland looks so much better than it did the last few years. And that is exciting to see because in terms of a conference, these guys are all close to each other. It, this is not a conference where it's spread out. These are all teams that they're a hundred percent alike each other. They're close. They're really good proximity. There's real natural rivals that you can create out of here. This is one of the more fun conferences if you like the old historic way of how to build a conference. So it'll be fun to continue to see these guys get more successful. But I am not ready to say this is a, a three-team race. I think this is an any-team race right now because it is hard to count out Nichols. They are 0-3, right? But it's also hard to put too much stock in Lamar at the same time because that Mississippi Valley State game, I get they won, but they struggled. And Mississippi mm. Valley State is awful. I mean, it's it's fun to see. Uh, yeah, I would say you, you got to look at McNeese, who just beat Stephen F. Austin, too. And they had a close game versus Tarleton. And everyone, you know, Tarleton's kind of the FCS darling right now where everyone's hoping that they continue to get better outside of Jamie Williams, who says they stink. But uh, <laughs> Didn't say th that, this will be a fun high. conference. This will be a fun conference. I think, you know, it's – Probably is still incarnate words to lose. I do agree with Matt right there. But you can't count out Nichols, who won it last year. You can't count out this new Lamar team. They got actually nice facilities, too. So, you know, they can continue to get better. So I like it. I like it. I just don't know who I'm willing to buy stock into yet. Uh, but what I will say I'm willing to buy stock into the conference. I think the conference is fun. And I think the conference can continue to get better, especially in the age of the portal. And for a little bit more expanded uh Talk on the Southland. Make sure you turn into the Southland sermon later this week. The Rev will uh, hit all of these teams and we'll let more, more depth than we've hit them here. Absolutely. Subscribe. Make sure you subscribe to FCS Fans Nation, Fans Nation Network on YouTube because that Southland sermon will be coming through with the Rev. Definitely got to check it out. And yeah, might, might be a little biased here because you got guys like Andrew, Zach, Neil. They're good dudes, you know? Yeah. They're good dudes. So we'll see you guys in Frisco. All right. I did a little flip -a I think this question comes up better next year, guys. Liam Maroney says outside of the top five teams who has had the most impressive start to the season really really like this question we've talked about the big dogs blah 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 are they good are they this where should they be ranked but outside those top five start of the season jamie i can't imagine what's going through your mind formulating a top 25 three really three games four games into the season 
what do you think? Taking those top five out. So I think we'll I'll, I'll cut it here. We'll take Villanova as the fifth team. They're they're gone. That's where most people had them five six to start. So we're South Dakota down based off of last week's poll. Who's been the most impressive? Uh, to me, it is Central Arkansas. Uh, a, an FBS game that is a loss on the record, but you know we we can just we beat that one to death. Uh, then they beat Lindenwood like they should, and then they hammered Austin P yesterday. And they've got that one-two punch at running back between Shun Derek Powell, who I believe leads the FCS in all-purpose yards, or at least yards from scrimmage. It's one of the two. And then Darius Hale has five or six touchdowns already to go along with Shun Derek's five or six touchdowns. That There's a lot of talent on that team. Oh, and by the way, they've probably got the best pure defensive player in the FCS as well. So they might be finally putting it all together. i am been really, really impressed with the Bears. Uh, I, th- I think they've got a real chance to to really make make some noise here. So I, that would be the team I'm, I'm looking at right now. Yeah, they do look good. They are also the background for our photo here and our theme color, if you're watching on YouTube for the Fans Nation podcast. And yeah, you've really been pounding him in terms of like, this is going to be the guy, possible Walter Payton. So it's been fun to watch. Let's watch those guys go. Kyler, who are you high on right now? Who's the most impressive outside of your top five? Yeah, of course. I mean, North Dakota looks pretty damn impressive. I mean, you got to give them a little bit of credit. Uh, but I'm going to go a little bit outside, and um, I'm going to say Mercer. Uh, and the offense damn. looks like, you know, we we may we may not know what's going to go on with their offense, but that defense looks nasty. I mean, this is a team where they've, they've only had three games, one touchdown scored against them, right? And it was a game that was already so in hand that it didn't really matter. Um, now, they haven't played the best teams, right? But they did murder, not murder, but they did just shut com- out, you know, Chattanooga completely. Chattanooga looked about the same offensively as they did versus Tennessee, as they just did versus Mercer, right? I mean, what, three points, three points, about 250 yards, 280 yards, couldn't get, really get anything on the ground moving, couldn't really throw the ball. So, I mean, if we're looking at like a defensive standpoint, that Mercer defense looks pretty damn stout. Um, again, that Presbyterian touchdown was already in hand. Bethune Cookman, again, they're not a great team, so the resume is not that fantastic yet. Outside uh, Chattanooga is way overranked. Um, but you got to give some props to this Mercer team right now. And if you're a team who's struggling on offense, but maybe has you know a decent defense, you probably don't want to play Mercer because Mercer might be a team that can completely shut down your offense. So if you have any doubts about your quarterback, about your running back, about your o- offensive line, you probably want to avoid Mercer right now at all costs because that defense looks pretty damn stout, and it, it's kind of fun to watch them play. Mercer Bears, you know, all that recruiting just starting to really pay off, you know, when you look at it. Go for um, it. Just like Furman. Yep. Speaking of Furman, you know, that's the next opponent of uh, William & Mary. William & Mary not looking too bad. I was, I was going through a few teams. I thought about, like, Southern Illinois looked okay. I did see Mercer when I saw this question. And then I was like, you know what? William and Mary's kind of sat here in the rankings. Jamie's brought them up a few times. I'm not saying that it's the most impressive resume, but I did say that Wofford would be a tougher out last week than it looked. And they only beat Wofford 28-21. Of course, lost to Coastal Carolina by 19 at FBS squad. Killed VMI to start the year. But I think William and Mary's got a shot. I'm I just have no expectations for basically in the CA for anyone in the CAA because of what you guys are always saying in terms of what that talent looks like in that conference. Um, probably not gonna be world beaters, but especially if you look at their schedule, they're off to at least a two and one solid start, and they're gonna play teams like Hampton, Host Campbell, you know, they're gonna go to NCA and T. Elon's coming to them. Richmond at the end of the year is gonna be a big game, but I don't know, William and Mary, they're probably right exactly what we expected right now, and that's better than ending up like a Youngstown State who just fell off the map or some of these others that do not look good to start the year. So uh, the last question here, guys, in the Big 7, thanks, Liam, for that one, is an interesting one. And, uh, Jamie, it might pull at your heartstrings just a little bit, but Preston Adams, I like this question and the the, the top six topics. He says, should Gardner-Webb feel good about their season moving forward despite being 0-3? We can talk Gardner Webb, of course, but also this could be a good springboard for anybody else in these conferences that maybe doesn't look good right now, but has a chance for a conference title. We typically see this in what? In the conferences that get one auto bid, right? Maybe they play two FBS schools and they get their can kicked by a Missouri Valley team. They're 0 3. They're 1 and 2. 
and they don't even look top 25 worthy, but they win six out of seven conference games or whatever it may be. And heck, there they are in the FCS playoffs trying to pull an upset in round one. So Gardner-Webb pulling up their schedule here on YouTube. Jamie, this is a team that has been close to include with your JMU Dukes. What are you feeling about them? And are there any other teams in kind of the smaller conferences that you feel like could really shoot up there after a rough out of conference start? Well, here's the problem that I have for for Gardner Webb. Uh, They look really good. Um, Tyler Rondell, who transferred from ETSU to Gardner Webb's kind of went the other way from, from Trey Lamb going to Gardner Webb. And who knows if Tyler Rondell had been the quarterback yesterday, maybe, maybe things are different because he's, he's a better pure passer than with, with, um, East Tennessee State has, but I mean, if you, like they've got three losses by what nine points, seven, eight, nine. They they could feel good about that. The problem that I see for them is Simo is way better than anybody else in that conference, including them. So they can feel good about it, but I just don't think that they're going to have anything that's going to let them build a resume at this point. They they needed that game yesterday. I don't know what happened. They were up. 16 points and yeah, they were up big. Yeah. And that shouldn't have happened. It might've been even more than 16. So yeah, they should feel good. They've played really, really good football. Uh, they got an offense that can kind of move the ball and a defense that that does good enough. But I think that they needed one of these to build, to help build a resume. Um, as far as something like that, as far as anybody else, I mean, I'm just kind of taking a quick look. They kind, kind of started of the, like that. It'd be Nichols. It'd be the same. It's in the same boat. Yep. And it started 0 and 3, but they they've got a better shot in the Southland than Gardner Webb does in the Big South OVC to me. There you go. I was kind of having the opposite approach as I dug into this question. I was surprised to see how the Pioneer League has started off so well in out of conference. It's not like the opponents are great, but you look at the the Pioneer League and you've got San Diego. San Diego beat Cal Poly, and I know they're hot garbage, Kyler, but there you go. That's a big sky win. Good job, San Diego. Drake, of course, RIP for our Eastern Washington team there, Kyler. But the of all teams, um, I'm taking the opposite approach of the question, Preston. Look at the Pioneer League. Go through Butler right now, who's 3-0. Look at a bunch of two and one squads. That's going to be a very competitive conference. I just wanted to give it its recognition because, yeah, that one could be a fun one to try to predict come playoff time. So, Kyler, any thoughts here about Gardner Webb or teams that should be feeling more optimistic as we are getting closer to conference play? I mean, Gardner Webb, if they're going toe to toe with like James Madison, Wofford, Charlie, I mean, they should feel confident going into a much weaker conference. The, the Big South OVC is, is not strong by any means. There's a good couple teams in there. Right, Simo, UT Martin could be potential. Um, Tennessee State has some, I guess, some flair where maybe they have a lot of talent. They might be able to put some boards, a score on the board, uh, or score pretty fast. But also, what you got to also take back is this is kind of alarming at the same time. Um, in all three of these games, they've been outscored in the fourth quarter, thirty-four to zero or thirty-four to six. Right, so that's where you, you got to have a little bit of concern on why aren't you able to close out some of those games? I get it, two of them were FBS. But Charlotte has lost to FCS teams in the past. They are not this dominant G5 program. They're pretty damn bad. I would actually rank them as a not playoff team. Um, just, just if they were in the FCS, I don't think they would come close to sniffing the playoffs. James Madison looks like a shell of itself from the last few years. Um, Wofford looks okay. They don't look like world beaters by any means. So you look at it and you go, yeah, we're competitive. We should have a chance to win this conference. But when you're outscored 34 to six in that fourth quarter, what's going on? Why are you dropping these leads? What's going on? I mean, it's, that's where it's got to have a little bit of like alarming, eye-opening self-reflection to where you go, you can't do this in any of these other um, games because what's that, what's that coach going to say at halftime? Hey, we're down. We're down to Gardner Webb. Guess what? They've lost every game from teams that are down. So we still have a fighting shot. All we need to do is have a little bit of momentum and we can still win this at the end of the game. So um, they should at least feel decent, right? They're they're basically 0-1. That, I mean, that's how we're looking at it with two very close competitive G5 teams. So that, that at least gives you a little bit of confidence moving forward. But again, I mean, who knows what's going to happen? I think they have a decent shot. We'll have to wait and see. It'll be fun to see how it plays out. And yeah, at least kudos to him for this. I mean, all those transfers uh, heading over to ETSU. And those are some pretty good ballplayers, trust me. But that's, uh, the, that's the thing about this portal, right? 
Yeah. It doesn't matter what you lose. You can gain it back so dang quick, especially if you're maybe more of a Southern team where there's an abundance of talent and an abundance of G5 programs and just FBS programs, FCS programs in general. Other players are going to leave their team if they're not happy with coach, not getting enough playing time, think there's a better fit. So you can easily turn it around, especially I think in the South and maybe more more else in anywhere um, else in the country where you I don't care who you lose. A new year is a new year in the in the FCS right now. Yeah, it's like NFL free agency. And you said it best, man. You said you can lose it and gain it back quick. Kind of like weight. You can lose it. And if you eat too many tacos, you gain it back quick. Taco King coming to you from bright and sunny Fargo, North Dakota. It's time for a taco bet and time for you losers to pay up. Everybody subscribes to this podcast for the corny intros and outros. 100%. That's a guarantee. All right, guys. Uh, Thompson's Taco Bet. I'm proud of this one. I, I hope you guys like this one. Did a little bit of research here. Here you go. The Southland Conference hasn't had a conference champion with two losses since 2019 <clears throat> and then the year prior, 2018. So 2018, 2019. The Southland Conference champ had two losses. Beyond before those years, you'd have to go back to 1991 when Sam Houston and McNeese were co-champions. In fact, McNeese had a tie, and Sam Houston had two losses. With an interesting Southland, here's the taco bet. Will the Southland champ have over or under 1.5 conference losses this season? It seems to be a rarity. If you're winning the Southland, it means you've got one conference loss. Kyler Neal, you just saw the conference, so I'm going to give it to you first. What do you think? Over or under 1.5? Well, I just said this conference is continuing to get better, and we're going to see a much more competitive conference. So, obviously, the bet is, no, uh, I'm not going to go with what probably you guys think after my whole Southland rant. I actually think probably the Southland champs are going to probably emerge, um, be a little bit better than everyone else in conference. So, I'm actually going to go under. I bet you they have one to zero losses in conference. Ah, sticking with history on your side. Okay, Jamie Williams, a little bit of chaos, or is someone going to just take it? Yeah, I, I was sure, you know, Kyler did that nice soliloquy back there. He was going to go over, and I was going to be like, ha, ah, it's going to be different. But, yeah, I'm going under. I, I think that the champ oh. has zero or one. I, it's, I just think Incarnate works better than everybody in there. And maybe I'll eat crow. Maybe Nichols will do what they did to him last year. Maybe Clifton McDowell will do something for McNeese. I don't know. I just – I think a corner word is that much better than everybody else, but it's still going to be a competitive conference. Okay. There's certainly times where I'm like, well, geez, the taco bed is lame. If we all agree, this isn't one of those times. I genuinely believe based off of what we've seen so far, someone's going to win it with two losses. I think there's going to be enough chaos. I like that. It feels like the Southland is talented. It used to just be a Sam Houston show. I think there's some real opportunity here. And that, unfortunately, comes to the detriment of the conference champion because it will affect seeding and other things. But I think your conference champion is going to end with two losses at a minimum. So I am going to take the over for this bet with the Southland. I was shocked at that whole 1991 thing going way back. That's, a, that's, that's impressive. Yeah, That's some be, research. It would be interesting. Thank goodness for Wikipedia. I need to donate them a few dollars. It's their pledge season, like PBS, I think. So, well, when you donate uh, it and you can go edit, can you go change the owner of the Miami Dolphins from Stephen Ross to Josh Allen? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for, the, for Bills Nation, I will do that. So, and I'll do it quickly just for you. Just because your question is answered quickly doesn't mean we don't care. It's time for this week's quick hit questions. All right, getting into the quick hits, gentlemen. Kyler, it starts with the Rev. Not really a question, but preaching to you. He says, not a question, but I do commiserate with Kyler as we are both suffering through bad coaching. Any moment to talk about how you feel like coaching issues, problems, just not a happy camper at Eastern? Um, it is It is pretty unfortunate to watch because when you're actually at the games and watching it, you can tell one team that keeps losing is so much bigger and more athletic than the other team. So, like, even this game, our, our quarterback, Kikoa, has played phenomenal this year. He's thrown above 80%, right? You're thrown above 80%. You have no picks. He's the second most efficient quarterback in the league so far this year. He's the most accurate quarterback in the league. And then you got an Efton Chisholm who's making Sports Center top 10 plays every single freaking catch. Dude, so that one-hander. It was insane. 
Um, and I felt bad because at the end of the game, you see, you know, Kikoa and a couple players on the sidelines, you know, kind of teary eye crying because of what's been going on. But you're in the red zone to take the lead. And you're third and eight. You're rushing the ball. And the rushing has been decent this season. But you're rushing an average of three yards a carry because SLU is actually playing pretty dang good defensive line ball. And again, you're in the red zone to take the lead with the most accurate quarterback in the NCAA right now. In the uh, one of the top tier wide receiver weapons in the NCAA right now. And you decide, let's run it. Makes no damn sense. Um, this is a team that should easily be 3-0. This is a team who will look probably athletically aligned with Nevada next week. This is a team that I think, if the coaching was right, could play with an Idaho-Montana State athletically. But the fact is, I, I just don't think the coaching is the correct way. So we're going to continue to have a rough season, which is unfortunate to see because these players deserve a little bit more right now. And hopefully, even if you're not an Eastern fan, if you're feeling that, you can uh, commiserate, as the Rev said. So hoping it gets a little brighter for the rest of the season for you, buddy. Cody Whirlinger says, Jamie, is Jason Eck the front runner for the Eddie Robinson Award? Here we go. Our award voter, Jamie. What do you think? Yeah, I mean... I wanted to vote for him last year, but he wasn't on the damn ballot. So that pissed me off. Uh, but yeah, I mean, how can he not be? Like that defense is phenomenal, and he's doing it with whatever he's got to do at quarterback right now. Hopefully, Jack Lane will be back sooner rather than later. Not that Jack Wagner's bad, but he's not Jack Lane, who's also not Giovanni McCoy. So you know, th yeah, he's doing a lot with that that team. Uh, he's he's in he's in the driver's seat. There's a lot of other coaches, I think, are um, positioned well. Um, somebody like a Pete Rossamondo at Lamar, I, I think he did a good job over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, I'll still stump for my guy, Delaney Fitzgerald. They had a terrible third quarter yesterday. But, it, you know, he's got an FBS win. Um, but, yeah, Jason, I, I think it's – I don't even think it's close right now. Uh, but we'll see. Long way to go. Uh, long way to go. He's looking good, though. And they seem to be having a ton of fun based off those locker room videos after games. Uh, Skylar Thiel there, Kyler says, is the Missouri Valley best overall conference or has the bottom half of the conference lost to enough inferior competition to weigh the conference down as a whole? What do you think? No, because if you look at all the other conferences, they've lost to inferior competition too. So I think as of right now, um, just like last year, uh, Missouri Valley was by far better last year. I think they're by far better this year. Um, and they're probably going to continue to. There's going to be some years where they're down. Maybe they're the not, not the top conference from top to bottom. But as of right now, it's hard to really push any other conference above them for sure. There you go. Missouri Valley still kind of t maintains that status as top dog. They are, yeah, once you get down to the top to the middle, it is a, a tough, tough conference. So, all right, guys, here we go. Uh, Mr. Jeremiah Rash, biggest surprise games yesterday. What shocked you? I'm I, pretty easy for me. That ETSU game, kudos to the Bucks. Hats off. I thought, obviously, had it won. You don't want to listen to me talk about this, but uh, I was mind blown that ETSU, what they did to NDSU throughout those games, and uh, I was also pretty surprised. I'll give one more Chattanooga. I mean, that final result against Mercer, like Chattanooga, is a team that is ranked top twenty-five, ten to three, ten to three. Chattanooga, like anybody could have won that game, but. That is a poor, poor showing. So defensive talent. Any other surprises you guys want to throw out there? Are we rolling through. Yeah, Vill Villanova only beaten Towson fourteen to thirteen. Connor Watkins mm -hmm. hasn't been very good this year. Fourteen to twenty five for one sixteen. Though we did throw for two touchdowns. Jalen Sanchez. Uh, that they just don't look right. Uh, they should easily have been the best team in the the CAA, but they're gonna rock it on down my ballot. Um, drop some spots here. Just not not impressed. There you go. Which preseason top 25 teams are already showing they don't belong, says the Rev, after three weeks of play, dot, dot, dot. If the FCS were the stock market, who are you buying? Who are you selling? We kind of already did buy in. That's from Kyler Elliott because we talked about teams that were impressed with outside of the top five. So let's go teams that we're not impressed with and that are just going to plummet down. So uh, who right now are you not impressed with there, Jamie Williams, that you've seen? Uh, I'll give you, you two. Uh... Western Carolina, uh, they they redeemed themselves a little bit with a win against Elon yesterday, so they might move back into my my ranking this week. And then Richmond, I, I thought that was going to be a lot better team, but they just they're not good. They had a good win yesterday, but just not good. Not good at all. Kyler, you got any teams that you're just like, nah, not not it, 
Not that the guy. C A A. I don't think any of them are good. I really think all of them are are bad. Me, well, bad. mediocre to bad. I don't think anyone's good. I, I think if we actually did a top 100, there's not anyone in the top 30. Really yeah, you you are dying on that hill. And we're going to see come playoff time, I guess, for sure. Uh, no, they're, they're going to play St. Francis, so they'll be all right. They'll get a win. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, Kevin is proud of you right now. Uh, Preston Adams wants to know, Preston says, since Matthew is a self-proclaimed spooky season fanatic, when does it start for him? So, love Halloween obsessed with christmas christmas to me starts the day the day halloween is over i literally bypass thanksgiving because the cowboys get their asses kicked <laughs> everybody texts me because they watch dallas lose and uh just whatever on thanksgiving spooky season pressing i'm a strict october 1st october 31st scary movies all that i theme the house out but uh allison can't handle scary movies to save her life so you know got to protect that that fragile heart no jump scares for Allison. She can't do it. So, uh, Preston does have another following up. And I'll give it right back to you, Kyler, since you just crapped on him. Did Villanova's close call yesterday highlight that they may not be as good as we thought or show that perhaps there are more CAA contenders than anticipated? Okay, so the conference can stink, but are there more contenders than Villanova? Yeah. In terms of who can win the conference, yeah, that conference is so unbalanced in terms of scheduling. You could have, it doesn't matter. Um, there's 14 shitty teams in that conference. So um, Villanova looks bad. I mean, they, they've never looked good. Last year, they only looked good in the playoffs until, you know, when they played bad teams. So um, I think it's just a bad conference. I think there's four teams who can win it. They're probably going to get four playoff teams in the playoffs too. So that's the, the bummer because that conference is so unbalanced. We need to put a stop. I don't even like the Missouri Valley and Big Sky having as many teams as they have. We need to put a stop or a cap on these conferences because it's ridiculous. So, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of contenders in that conference. Uh, New Hampshire could, could easily win it all. Um, who knows? I have no clue what's going to happen. Shoot, Mammoth. Who knows? They could be a top five team in the conference, and they're horrible. So, yeah, it's going to be weird to see. Yeah, watch watch Towson beat NDSU next week and then see Who knows? Maybe the whole the FCS stinks. Yeah, who knows? Uh, guys, two fun ones here to end it. The Rev gives us a great one. I can't remember if this was asked if you were stranded on a desert island, but what Ooh. books would you want with you? What books would you want with you? Uh, start with the why would be one that I'm going to bring back to you, Rev. And uh, I don't read a lot of books, but in elementary school, this is weird, but I remember in fourth grade being obsessed with the book Moby Dick with the big old whale. I loved how the guy would float out there. And they tried to kill this giant whale. I just thought it was so cool. And I like the lesson in it where if you just chase something forever and obsess with it, it actually can be quite a detriment because I think the whale drags him down in the end. So uh, I don't know. I like Moby Dick. I, I read that's probably the only book I've read over and over again. I remember from elementary school. So I'd take that one. Jamie, what would you bring out on a desert island for books? Um, I've got a quite I've got like three or four authors that I read fairly regularly. So I read a bunch of David Baldacci and Lee Child, so those are similar. But then I, Jeff Shara does uh, historical fiction. I got a lot of John Grisham, and then uh, Don Winslow is another win author that I like. A little uh, fun story about Moby Dick. So I had same. I read it when I was a kid. I happened to find my copy of Moby Dick when I was moving. Probably, I guess when we moved into this house, I found the book, and in the middle of it was a folded up piece of paper. And that piece of paper was a letter I wrote trying to get autographed football cards from the Buffalo Bills when I was 12. <laughs> cool. So it was kind of interesting. I think I, I think I probably left it in there. I could probably, I see the book right there up on the bottom shelf. I could probably go find it. Um, my, the funny thing is the handwriting is still the exact same. Uh, it's still <laughs> just as scratchy and messy. Uh, just a cool little uh, thing that I found. I was like, huh, I just never mailed that off, but it was a nice bookmark. That's awesome. That's cool. Childhood stories, Moby Dick, holding strong. Kyler, any reading? Any any books? Um, there's gonna be a few books I would I would probably bring to a deserted island. One would be How to Survive on a Deserted Island for Dummies. I'm sure that book's out there. Other than that, um, you know, Where's Waldo would be pretty fun. Keep you busy for a little bit. Sudoku, maybe a coloring book. Um, because I'm not reading if I'm on a deserted island. I got other things I gotta figure out. I gotta you know chop some wood, get some food. Reading is the last thing on my mind, unless that is preparing me how to survive. 
That is a phenomenal answer. Hey, you mentioned food. And our final question here in Quick Hits, Lee Tornbog says, what is your breakfast of champions before you go tailgate? So, Kyler, that with that great answer, you're thinking food already. What would you take to the tailgate? What is it? You calling me fat? No, you're I'm thinking call, food already. Jesus call, Christ, man! Calling you sexy, um, sexy in those colors. I mean, honestly, I'm not a big breakfast guy, but if I had to do one for tailgating, because beer will be flowing, um, probably a classic egg bacon cheese sandwich. I mean, that just that gets the that gets the the food ready. I mean, that that's just gonna prep you for the whole day. You got a little bit of carbs, a little bit of protein, and some deliciousness. Yeah, I'm 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 a basic B man. I'm but I'm like you, Kyler. Give me give me a bunch of scrambled eggs and throw a bunch of bacon on there, and like that's it. You throw cheese on top. Like I don't need anything crazy in the morning. I would love to say donuts because at heart I'm a kid who just eats cake and cupcakes. <laughs> but when you eat a big Sandy's donut or something in the morning, it just weighs you down. So yeah, I'll take the uh, thing that can go with some drinks. Jamie, final breakfast thing, buddy. Yeah, I'm not a big breakfast person, but I'll just take some bacon. Just give me some bacon. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Ron Swanson, Jamie, Jamie Williams, ladies and gentlemen, right there. This is phenomenal. I'll have all oh. the bacon. Yep. We <laughs> won't need breakfast for uh for Frisco this year because it's gonna be a night game. We're gonna have mm. plenty of time to grab some lunch and tailgate all afternoon. Monday night football for the FCS championship. That'd be fun. It will be fun, as was this episode, as this brings us to the end of the FCS Fans Nation podcast. Thank you so much to everybody for listening to us. Make sure, if you'd like to join FCS Gold and listen to this ad-free, the link is in the description below on YouTube, also on our Facebook and Twitter page. You also, uh, if you enjoy this podcast, you can listen to it, of course, starting on Sundays, right away that evening if you subscribe on YouTube. free Some YouTube ads, no big deal. But a lot of you guys are still listening on Spotify and Apple. We appreciate you. But that does post on Wednesdays. If you want to be 72 hours ahead of time, make sure you subscribe on YouTube and check us out on there. So, Jamie, you got a, you got some things to rush to, some real-life stuff. So I'm going to give you the final floor this evening to take us out of the FCS Fans Nation podcast. Any final thoughts before we get into the end of out-of-conference play next week? Yeah. Don't speculate too much. Don't overreact. Enjoy the games. Long way to go. Uh, don't rush the season away. Uh, well, it'll be here before you know it, whether you want it to or not. Just enjoy the games. Have fun. There you go. One day at a time. Thanks for joining us on the FCS Fans Nation podcast. We'll catch you next week. Boom. Thank you for listening to the FCS Fans Nation podcast. Make sure to leave a like, a comment, and subscribe on YouTube. To listen ad-free and enjoy many other perks, join FCS Gold for only 99 cents a month by using the link in the description below. Make sure to follow FCS Fans Nation on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the premier podcast for FCS football. By then, we'll Hell be yeah. If not, we'll be real close. Oh, yeah. Easy money. <clears throat>